Children's Hospital in Newcastle in Australia. And he has a passionate interest in um, hemodynamics, especially in the preterm baby. Uh, I don't think that's the title he gave me, but it, um, I was too lazy to change it. So he can tell us what the title is after this. Uh, as usual, uh, with the next slide, uh, Rahul, if you can. Um, so the talks, uh, with Kurt's permission, will be posted on our social media groups, um, which is on this slide here. Um, we have um, several chat groups, WeChat, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram. So, um, you know, you can join and you can get notices about um, other talks as well. Um, for this chat, we will mute everyone on entry. And if you have any questions, please type it onto your chat pane and um, Kurt will answer them at the end. We'll try to leave about uh, 15 minutes at the end of the talk for the questions. But if you have any other your serious burning questions, please raise your hand. Kurt's always available on email to answer questions if you have some that come up after the talk. Um, and um, this talk has been translated to Mandarin as well. So Dr. Fan in Hunan, uh, in Shisha Shuang, will be happy to give you a translation of this uh, talk. So we are now three minutes past five and um, without further ado, um, I'll pass the baton over to Kurt DeWall. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Um, this should be the full screen. You got my full screen? Yes, thank you. Looks good. All right. Um, thanks, Julie, for inviting me again to come talk. Um, I kept the title because that's the title you gave me. Right? Um, it's a story of the preterm heart. It's, it's much um, a more of an awareness kind of story than a clinical story. Um, but the clinical story of what we do in neonatology has impact all the way throughout adulthood. And that's sort of what this talk is about. So um, can we fix a preterm heart for life? And I think there's opportunities and possibilities for us to, to think about it, at least be aware of what it is we're doing with the preterm heart. So the outline of this story is, uh, first I'll, I'll take you back to embryology and show you how the heart develops. And, and then we go to a couple of slides showing what the impact is of preterm birth on cardiac development, either in the NICU itself and through to adulthood. And at the last um, session, bit of this session in this talk, we're gonna um, hypothesize mostly about how we can optimize cardiac development after preterm birth. All right, so, um, so let's begin with the embryology. This is cardiac development in its very earliest stages, which is called the specification, where the first heart field and the second heart field come together and they form a tube, which then is going to get elongated with a venous pole at the bottom, an arterial pole at the, at the top, which then you have your linear heart tube. After the elongation, you get the looping of the heart. First, the C looping where the left and the right ventricle are sort of placed together and there's a primitive combination. And then you get your S looping, where actually everything is turned upside down and the ventricles become at the bottom and the combination comes at the top. During the same time in specification, there is also vascular development. It's on the left, you can see vascular genesis forming from angioblast into arterial and venous vessels and segregate and you have primitive capillary plexuses. And on the right, you see the lymphoid angiogenesis, which comes from a vein and from primitive lymphatic plexuses. And the total angiogenesis is all these three together, arteria, lymphatic vessels, and veins. The second bit of the cardiac development actually has less sort of changes into um, its actual shape and place, um, but there is a lot of changes inside the heart and um, more specification. So this is called the morphogenesis. It starts with migrating neural crest cells, which form the, um, the, um, the big uh, vessel on the top and a uh, um, separation of the right and the left atrium. At that point, the trabeculation starts when you get little sort of into, into the side of the heart and the septation starts. There's a septation of the left and the right ventricle and of the atria and further formation of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And at the end, you get valve formation and further trabeculation and forming of these 
um, sort of complete heart. And as with everything, um, in the last uh, decades, investigators have found many, many um, genetic um, cues or signaling which um, take place during this cardiac development. And they call it a genetic blueprint for cardiac development. And to all these different precursors, they have found that the cardioblast, the cardiomyocyte are specialized due to different kinds of genes and different kinds of signaling into either the conduction system, the atria, the valves, or the left and the right ventricle. So the factors which are involved in cardiac development, besides those genetic factors, there are biochemical factors, neural innovation, myocardial cell architecture itself. But importantly, and I'll show you in the next few slides how important that is, it's about mechanical force forces or actually intercardiac blood flow. And it's really interesting because um, very early on, we already know that the heart starts beating, but the heart actually starts beating well before active transport of oxygen and nutrients by the circulation is required. If the fetus is very small, it can do it by diffusion. But even then, the small heart in the fetus already starts to beat. As you can see in this very old study by the Bose, um, which showed that already at week five or so, the heart starts beating at this low rate of about 60 to 100 and climbs up to 150 over the next few weeks. So why is this necessary? Why does there have to be flow inside the fetal heart? The distribution of flow is also in one direction. It goes from the venous to the arterial pole, a simple sort of contractions and, and relaxation to different parts of the primary sort of tubular form of the heart. And the reason that is necessary is now better understood. These intracardiac blood flow creates hemodynamic forces on the cardiomyocytes. We all are aware of pressure, which goes um, I mean, straight on to the cardiomyocytes, but probably more important in this particular aspect is the shear stress, which is the amount of pressure and sensation which the cardiomyocytes might feel perpendicular to the cardiomyocytes. Because this pressure and shear stress um, actually activate genes into the myocardiocytes, which then drive further cardiac development. Different kinds of systems have been discovered over time, which then starts with trabeculation, compaction, septation, and later on valve formation. And this system and how that is, is um, developing is, is genius. Um, and I will show you some examples of how that is. So the first thing which is important is trabeculation. Its finger forms sort of networks, trabecular networks, which consist of a trabecular endocardium, trabecular myocardium, and the compact myocardium into the ventricle cells. Um, in the adult life and in, in later life, it is needed for increased surface area. There is an increased mass that gives better wall stiffness. However, in, during this cardiac morphogenesis and maybe cardiac maturation phase, it's probably more important to actually do something different. This is a busy slide, um, which is done in using the zebrafish where they measure the looping and the, and the trabeculation. But what they show by looking at velocity streamlines and the different sort of specialized um, areas into this heart, that once there is a tubular heart and laminar blood flow, in the second phase, what happens is the looping. And the looping already changes this nice laminar blood flow pattern. The blood flow goes more around and changes the pressure and particularly the shear stress on each particular wall. But then when trabeculation started, that significantly changes the local shear stress in different places in and around the heart. As you can see in the picture all the way on the right, that the laminar flow into the big vessels of this zebrafish heart are still there but there is particular areas where there is already sort of circular kind of motion of local shear stress changes, and it changes due to um, trabeculation. And it goes even further. For instance, after trabeculation, you get the compaction and for instance, valve formation. This is in a study which looked at valve formation where they saw that at particular areas where valves supposed to be fall, um, formed, there is a different shear stress and there's a different pressure throughout the changes with the trabeculation 
and the looping. And then from very early on in these specialized kind of areas, you can see early on that the shear stress is changing the growth on one end compared to the growth on the other end of where the valve. And then finally, sort of over time, you can see the valve actually forming itself. And on top of that, the valve itself will then give a different flow pattern, intercardiac blood flow. It's, um, again, which gives different shapes and different growth and patterns afterwards again. And the last system which takes a role as well is the developing cardiac conduction system, which is done by different genes. In the tubular phase, we knew that the heart was beating very regular at a very low pace, which is the embryonic pacemaker, which is the only SA nodal pacemaker. Once the heart got steadily looped, then you get the AV canal delay, <clears throat> where the delay generator is sort of formed into the system's M of the heart. And then when the heart becomes trabeculated, we get the actual apex to base activation after the septation of the ventricles and the hysprochemic vessels are formed. <clears throat> so the combination of all these three factors, the tubular looped trabeculation valves, and however you want to look at it, it changes intracardiac blood flows from being very simple to more complex to the more mature things that you can see on the right. And each shape and each form will provide different shear stress and different pressure inside each individual chambers of the heart. So early cardiac development, specification and morphogenesis is a complex process of gene signaling. Then you have your looping, trabeculation, septation, and valve formation. And there's also significant biochemical changes on the data which I haven't shown. But what I did show to you, and, uh, and you might appreciate now, there is an essential role of changing intracardiac blood flow patterns, which have to do with the further development of the heart. So during this presentation now, I only talked about specification and morphogenesis, which is in the first eight weeks of fetal life, very early on. And then afterwards, and that's, this is actually a little bit less studied, is cardiac maturation from those very early stages up to term, adolescence, and into adulthood. The heart is still maturing and getting bigger. How does that work? We know from early fetal studies, looking at um, growth of the heart that we know on length here on the left, which goes sort of linear up into gestation. But for instance, mass seems to be um, getting bigger at the end of gestation, proportionally more than it did at the beginning of gestation. The cardiomyocytes during the fetal life are arranged in myo myofiber tracts, which is fantastic study by Macau, which used MRI diffusion tractography to look at how those fibers are organized into the heart from very early on in gestation. We see not a, a very few of these fibers to week 40 as a term baby. We see a lot of these fibers and nicely sort of spirally organized. They are organized in a spiral way for a particular function. Because if you look at the heart in specific ways, you know it's this double folded sort of heart structure with the left ventricle in the middle and the right ventricle sort of folded around it. It has this kind of spiral organization of its myofibril tracts because it produces a much higher ejection fraction compared to if a heart was developed with only circumferential vessels. So it's much more efficient this way to place in this way. Now in these early phases, particularly in the morphogenesis and, and in the early phases, cell growth and cell division, which is called cell proliferation or hyperplasia, each cell sort of splits and then also each of these cells split again and each of these cells split again. And that's what's happening mostly during specification in morphogenesis. And the proliferation index is really high. However, during maturation, this, this changes. Then cell growth is actually more towards hypertrophy. It just gets bigger. The cell itself just gets bigger and firmer. This maturation process, and on this picture, as you can see here, where they looked at different sort of, um, these are mice, and um, the proliferation index shown in red and yellow was quite high in the beginning and has the sort of maximum in the middle, but then you see it slowly disappearing and there is less and less cardiomyocytes proliferating. So, um, growing and division at the same time. And this is an important aspect. 
we see and we know from babies already that proliferation initially is very high, but even before birth, this proliferation index already is reduced and there's less cells which go into the proliferation phase of the cell cycles. More and more cells will become binucleated and have two pairs into one cell and some have polyploidization and where there is more gene pairs into the actual nucleus. But both these binucleated and polyploid cells are not able to proliferate anymore. And then when you go on further on in life and you become an adult, it's estimated that less than 1% of all the cardiomyocytes are capable of proliferating. And this has an important impact because if you damage your heart, for instance, with a myocardial infarct, it's very hard to repair with cardiomyocytes. You might repair it with collagen or with something else, but that is not as effective as repairing it with cardiomyocytes. And this amazing study by Bergman and Cell in 2015 actually proved that this was the case. They did carbon dating in patients who died from other reasons than um, um, cardiac reasons. And they looked at the age of the cardiomyocytes. And as you can see in the lower right corner that if the patient died around 25 years of age, the cardiomyocytes were, most of them were about 25 years old with carbon dating. The same applied if they were 50 years old, most of them were about 50 years old and the same at 75 years. Some cells were, were still able to proliferate and maybe more than the 1% which it was estimated about, but still most of the cardiomyocytes which you have in your heart right now are actually the ones you got from birth. And this switch to hypertrophic growth is variable. It's variable per species and not only per species, it's probably what you have to do when you are born. And um, mice, it starts very early after birth. Pigs and dogs and humans are a little bit later actually after birth. But for instance, sheep, they already start before birth to switch from hyperplasia to hypertrophic growth of the cardiomyocytes, which is shown in the brownish color. There's a similar change with increasing cardiomyocyte nucleation, OED, shown in blue. And there is also a change or a transition to fatty acid oxidation metabolism, usually happening a little bit before the cardiomyocyte switched to hypertrophic growth. For humans, all the way at the bottom, as you can see, that switch supposed to take place about a month to two months after birth. So we come to the question which might be more relevant to our, us as neonatologists. So what if you are born preterm? So the normal pathways is 10 weeks of specification and morphogenesis, 30 weeks of maturation to come to term birth, and then another 30, uh, 70 to 80 years of maturation until um, you pass away. But if you're born preterm, and particularly if you're born very preterm, what will happen then? What would the heart look like? Does it look different than a term birth? And probably maybe more important, if you do 10 to 15 weeks of preterm birth and add the 70 to 80 years, what will happen then? So let's look at cardiac development after preterm birth. What's the cardiac heart has to undergo compared to fetal life, if it comes to pressure and shear stress. Well, when compared to a similar stage in fetal life, preterm infants or preterm hearts, probably a better term, have to manage a lower pulmonary arterial pressure because now the lungs are open and they're working compared to a fetus. But they have a higher blood pressure, which is a higher afterload to the heart. They have higher intracardiac pressures and they certainly have higher intracardiac blood flows. So all of these items, particularly for the left ventricle, and probably the changes are slightly different for the right ventricle, it does mean that there is an altered exposure to shear stress and pressure for cardiomyocytes. And at the beginning of the talk, I have explained to you the importance or the essential role of shear stress and pressure on the development of cardiomyocytes. So it's highly likely that this will have an effect on what the heart will look like. Bensley is an Australian researcher who is probably the first one who showed this in a sheep study. Um, the, he looked at term in black and preterm and they um, sheep in right. And they looked at the number of mononucleated cardiomyocytes and then the binucleated and trinucleated 
from left to right. So on the left, you see the mononucleated cardiomyocytes and the preterm infants. They're supposed to have more of those, and they do. However, when it comes to the binucleated cardiomyocytes, they're actually not supposed to have those. And they have lots of them, almost as much as the term soup. And trinucleated cardiomyocytes, you're not supposed to have those at all. And again, the preterm heart, right ventricle and left ventricle, have significantly more of these types of cells. And these types of cells are no longer able to proliferate. He also found that cardiomyocyte volume of all these cells, whatever type you looked at, were higher for the preterm um, myocardiocyte than for the term cardiomyocyte. So this means these cells are bigger with a bigger volume, but are not bigger due to more cells. Again, a sign of hyperplasia. So increased cardiomyocyte ploidy, increased cardiomyocyte volume, and I haven't shown G, but it was also increased collagen uh, deposition. This is all um, microscopic um, and relevant to hypertrophic growth. So Bensley concluded for the first time that preterm births is most likely accelerating the change from hyperplasia, cell growth and cell division or proliferation, to hypertrophy, which is cell growth alone. These studies have been repeated by several investigators and all found consistent findings. So Richardson's um, made sort of a, a graph for it and showed it's like, what, what about over a lifetime? If you're an adult, you look at the cardiomyocyte number on the, on the y-axis and lifetime on the x-axis. That means that, okay, so if you born term, your cardiomyocyte numbers will first increase and then actually come down before you're born. And then from there on, will actually only go down in proliferation. And then the cell um, volume would increase because you go from um, proliferation to getting to hypertrophic growth. So just cells getting bigger. But if you depict preterm birth in this, so everything will happen a bit earlier and there'll be less cardiomyocyte numbers, maybe not extreme, but there will certainly be less cardiomyocyte numbers covering the heart. And these will then again have higher volumes to compensate for this. But the ones we're worried about the most is probably the extreme preterms, the 28 weeks and below, which will actually have significantly less cardiomyocyte numbers when they're born and unable to make more once they're born. So they mean they have way less cardiomyocyte numbers when they're an adult, and they have to compensate with way bigger sort of hearts or bigger cells to, um, to get the same sort of mass. So the next question is, this is all interesting and it's adults and it's you know, a, an estimation of what's going on in life. Does, does this actually really happen? Is this happening? And if it does happen, does this impact adult cardiac function? Is it important that it actually happens? Not just the shape, but also the function. Well, the short answer is, yes, this happens. This is the first study by Adam Lewandowski, which looked at um, ad young adults born preterm, and he did MRI in a large group of young adults born term, shown in green on the left, and young adults born preterm, shown in blue on the right. And what he showed that the young adults born preterm showed shorter and hypertrophic arts, exactly as you would expect there's less myocardiocytes in total, and they will be bigger. So you will get a shorter hypertrophic heart. And importantly though, if you look at the distribution of prematurity in this particular population, it was only a very small percentage, very young, 14% was 23 to 27 weeks, 55% was 28 to 31 weeks, and 32 to 36 weeks was a third of the population. They're not even that preterm. But these changes could already be found at age 25. Does it matter? Does this uh, have any impact then? Well, they did some further studies. This is a study which looked at longitudinal strain, which is uh, something called speckle tracking imaging, where the software sort of follows the shape of the heart. It is blue and the red shape shows the shortening of each segment of the heart. Um, strain rate is then the parameter which is closest related to um, contractility, which you can see the results on the right. They looked at 25-year-old adults born term, which is the green line, during systole and diastole. And then they looked at the 25-year-old adults born preterm, 
which is the blue line. And as you can see, both during systole and diastole, the, the adults born preterm did significantly less well. And it looked like, this is the red line, that the preterm hearts, particularly on diastolic function, were performing as a 35-year-old adult born term. So it seemed like the heart of a 25-year-old adult born preterm aged 10 years earlier than you would expect at this particular age range between 25 and 35 years of age. And then Huckstep from the same group put these adults onto the treadmill um, and then he measured the ejection fraction during peak exercise. So during rest and to 40% exercise increase, both the term and the preterm, term in blue, preterm in orange, could increase their ejection fraction from around 63 to around you know, 75 to 80. But if you increase the exercise even more to 60% and 80%, the preterm adult, the adult born preterm did not perform as well. And you can see a significant reduction in ejection fraction, indicating that these hearts are not, um, do not have enough reserve to deal with this increased exercise intensity. So besides having a functional difference, as I showed you, in strain rate and peak exercise, if you look at epidemiological studies, it actually has more than just these particular risks. This is an epidemiological study from CAR, and which looked in a very large cohort in Sweden at the risk of heart failure. These infants were born between 1987 and 2012, over two and a half million was the cohort. And the reference was set at term babies, 37 and above. And as you can see with decreasing gestation rates, the increase, the risk of heart failure increased to 1.36 when you were 32, 36, to 3.58 when you were 28 to 31, to 17 times higher if you were less than 28 weeks of age at birth. Now, of course, um, the absolute number of heart failure in this population, the oldest patient was only 30 years of age, um, was not that high, but a 17 times increased risks would alarm most epidemiologists. This is a study from Crump, which looks again in the same um, cohort or the same country, but now looked at the risk of ischemic heart disease. And it did find a slight difference between preterm, which is in orange, and the early full and post-term coma babies, but I, I don't think the significance here, the difference was here was significant. So this is a slightly older cohort. Now the attain, um, attained age was up to 43 years of age. So maybe, maybe not ischemic heart disease, but heart failure, which fits way more with the pathology which you would expect in the heart after preterm birth was certainly an item. Quimp did another study in which they um, looked, did a systematic review, looking at all cause mortality of adults born preterm. This is eight studies, ages 18 to 45 years, very large cohort, over six and a half million um, participants, and the attained age, um, age indeed up to 45 years of age. And as you can see, the risk group, which is the one less than 28 weeks at the top in red, was significantly higher hazard ratio for all course mortality compared to the other gestational age groups. So this is a concern. It seems that adults born preterm do have reduced heart function and it has clinical consequences over time. What happens then if you get more older, when you get older or senior age? Well, this is a picture I could find on the internet, which is neonatology 16 years ago. And they could do exceptional things at the time, but survival in the less than a thousand grammar, which is the population most at risk, was only 10%, it was, um, was only 10%. So we won't have that many adults born very preterm to study at this moment. So we don't know for sure what is gonna happen when these patients turn 60, 70, or 80 years of age. However though, if you look at the evidence which is around them, some of the studies I've shown you, but there are more studies to show, it is likely that adults born very preterm will show a higher risk of heart at a younger age and with reduced life expectancy. This all fits with the Barker 
theory is no longer a hypothesis. This is the Barker theory, where adverse environments in fetal life and early childhood establish an increased risk of disease in adult life. We see it for other things as well, including diabetes and kidney failure. And do you think that the first nine months shape the rest of your life if it comes to cardiac development? So Leeson coined um, this new term, or actually presented that you know, preterm birth is a new, new acknowledged risk factor for early heart failure. And he sees it this way, he described it this way, which I, I, I really liked. It is about myocardial reserve. So the term baby starts a bit higher than the preterm baby. And overall, this should be all right. However, if you get a simple viral myocarditis in childhood, it will go down and come back up, but not as high as before. And then maybe in later adulthood, you get a myocardial infarction, and you go back down and you might come back up, but maybe not as much as, as, as the term baby would do. So clinical heart failure will be seen earlier and um, more prominent in these particular situations. And to be honest, this story is not new. We see exactly the same story with preterm lung function over time and preterm kidney function over time which also both have reduced reserve capacity and particularly with intermittent diseases can lead to earlier disability and um, limitations over life. So can an neonatologist do something about it? Um, well, there's a couple of questions I think we have to go to first to see what we can do about it. So first, how can we diagnose and classify cardiac development? It's called cardiac modeling in preterm infants. Can we, um, when can abnormal cardiac development first be detected? And can we then most importantly predict which infants will develop significant cardiac pneumonia? Well, the first question is actually relatively simple. Can we classify this? There are, there are two nice classifications, um, which the first is done by Cohn in 2000, which was a consensus meeting with all the adult cardiologists. And this is probably the one that you're most familiar with. It takes two measurements, um, left, ventricular end diastolic volume and then left ventricular mass. And then it separates it into both are normal. Normal, if you just have increased mass, it's called hypertrophy. If you just have increased volume, it's called dilatation. And if you have both, it's dilated hypertrophy. In 2011, GASH added something to it because they found that the relative wall thickness, which is the amount of increase in mass versus the amount of increase in volume, were actually quite constant in adults. So they added relative wall thickness so they can make a slightly more and more um, detailed sort of a classification of cardiac remodeling, where now you have physiological hypertrophy and physiological enlargement still in there. For instance, in, um, if you do a lot of bench pressing, you will get physiological hypertrophy. If you do a lot of bike riding or running, you will get physiological enlargements. So we now categorize these as normal, um, but within the context of what you do in your life and how you train your heart. However, dilated hypertrophy is still the worst one to have in related to long-term outcomes. So we did two studies to look at cardiac modeling in the NICU period. The one on the right by Neil Kenfat, um, and it's a PhD. Um, he did this landmark study looking at this pattern of cardiac remodeling. His comparator were healthy near-term babies. We compared very preterm babies with healthy near-term babies of a couple of days. And he found that 22% had dilated hypertrophy at the end of their NICU period. And about 23% physiological enlargement. So they're still enlarged, they're still dilated. And these babies don't do much um, bicycling or running. So you wonder if that is actually normal or not. Then um, New Lee, a student, and came by and did a bit similar kind of work, but to use the comparator data from a, a UK cohort, which had healthy fetuses, and used exactly the same methodology. And if you use healthy fetuses in this comparator, then 50% had dilated hypertrophy. 8% hypertrophy, 12% dilated, so quite a lot. And importantly, she found that 17% of these remodeling changes could be found very close after birth, which was much higher than expected, for instance, based on our rate of um, small for gestation rate, or gross certificate babies, which was around 10% in each cohort. 
Cox and his group from the UK, they looked at the differently they used cardiac MRIs and looked at preterm infants and term infants throughout the NICU stay and at discharge. And they used a slightly different classification, but of course they have the advantage that MRI, you can look at the left ventricle, which is presented at the top, and at um, the right ventricle, which is presented at the bottom. And at the left ventricle, they found that sphericity, which is the length and the width relationship, and the taper, which is sort of a shape, or more significantly different between the preterm infants in blue and the term infants in red. And again, with the right ventricle, there were changes to see uh, uh, again, globularity, which is again the shape of the right ventricle and length were different between the preterm infants in blue and the term infants in red. These studies and a couple of other studies have then tried to find risk factors for cardiac and um, And the results were, I would say actually slightly disappointing, but I do have to admit that none of these studies are large enough to actually find these risk factors and we certainly need more data about this to give us a better indication which infants are most at risk. Two factors actually came out of it um, in all studies. Fetal growth restriction, early after birth, and a discharge could show cardiac remodeling compared to a healthy term baby. And younger gestational age, the younger you are, significantly related with more risk of cardiac remodeling. Other factors which we would expect or you might expect, antenatal steroids, postnatal steroids, mechanical ventilation, the PDA, that's the one we were expecting. Actually, that didn't come out of the logistic progressing um, regressive modeling as a risk factor for cardiac remodeling. So depending on the comparator, about a quarter to a half of very preterm infants have evidence of abnormal cardiac um, development called cardiac remodeling at NICU discharge. And most of these transits occur during the neonatal intensive care period, and that's essential as well. And this phenomenon has been labeled cardiomyopathy of prematurity. So again, come back to the question, yeah, okay, so what can we do something about it? Can we predict it? Who will develop this? How can we measure this? Do we have a diagnostic tool? I think some tools are actually now coming our way to play with this. So I'll bring you back to this um, pressure and shear stress and, and the importance of intracardiac hemodynamic forces, which continues during a maturation. So also during the NICU stay. Can we measure shear stress? Well, shear stress is something which is related to fluid dynamics. And this picture shows the very basics of fluid dynamics. If you have a column of fluid flowing from right to left, or from, sorry, from left to right over the screen, and it flows along the wall, then the velocity of the, the column closest to the wall will go slower than the ones above it. And if that process continues, you get that the upper part will go faster, go forward, and then fall over, just like the sea, as a rotational body of fluid, which is called the vortex. Vortices are everywhere in nature. I already um, reminded you of the sea, but animals use it to fly, fish to swim, jellyfish to move about, and um, because vortices in nature have some evolutionary purposes. The ev evolutionary purpose of vortices are conservation of kinetic energy, minimizing shear stress. So this is where the relationship with shear stress comes and maximizing flow efficiency. So if you think about these vortices, if we can fly this through the left ventricle, for instance, then the picture would look something like this. Intracardiac blood flow in the left ventricle where it comes into the heart and it goes to the other side where the outflow is, it will then almost by definition form a vortex in the middle of the heart. And this vortex will pull in more blood all by itself without contributing or costing energy. So it's an energy efficient way of drawing the blood from the inflow area to the outflow area. And it's a little bit more complex than on that 2D picture because a vortex is actually a moving 3D structure. It's a vortex ring which goes down from the top here in this picture to the bottom. And that vortex ring sort of moves itself throughout and the cardiac function mostly in diastole. It starts at the peak E wave and during diastole it forms itself and goes down into the ventricle. And then when the A wave begins, you get a second vortex sort of already happening. And during end diastole, all these forces are combined and changing into fluid dynamics. And then 
this system will begin and everything will be expelled outwards so the vortex ring will be destroyed. To show you this a little bit better, this is an amazing study by Ruby Trip and his team in the UK, where they use 4D ultrasound, fetal ultrasound, and computational fluid dynamics. And the colors will represent wall shear stress as we are interested in, with the red colors being the most shear stress and the blue the less. So this is the right ventricle they looked at. Here's the blood going into the ventricle diastole, and then it goes out of the ventricle in systole. And as we look at that again, you can see this vortex formation first and second one, and sort of blow out. But also importantly, you can see the areas where the wall stress is the most. There are certain areas in the heart and on the ventricle where the wall stress will be the most. So this might just give us some idea and some indication of where and how we can measure this. Measuring intracardiac blood flow can be done um, initially with MRI. That's probably the easiest technique. It's 3D and the right on the left here, you see the left ventricle in an adult. On the right, you see the right atrium in a, in a baby. And we can look at different intracardiac blood flow patterns and vortex formation. And there's been several studies about it. And, and Pedizetti is one of the experts in this field. And he explains it that the vortex is actually an early predictor of cardiovascular outcome. It's, it's a, a measurement of cardiovascular health. And he explained that by this picture, if you look all the way to the left, as a healthy heart with an in and the outflow, just as I showed you before, as an elongated vortex, low turbulence, perfect sort of symmetry, and um, not a lot of loss of energy. However, is there, if there is impaired flow for whatever reason, um, either the valve, the, heart, the, the stiffening of the heart itself, you get incoherent broken vortices and high turbulence. The heart sort of stiffens up and you get even more broken vertices and more turbulence happening. And then it starts to react as you would expect with increasing shear stress. It will hypertrophy, it will dilate, it will get bigger. And that's exactly what happens in most of these hearts. And once the progressive adaptation has taken place, you get circular vortices again, but much more than you were used to. And, but again, with low turbulence to sort of avoid that high turbulence situation, which are highly energy inefficient. You can measure intracardiac blood flow with ultrasound as well. In the adults, they can use something called particle image velocimetry, PIV, but they have to use a contrast. Um, and there's a new technique on the market with some um, um, ultrasound producers, which is called vector flow mapping, which uses color Doppler signals and make different kinds of um, um, streamlines. But, you can have some information of intracardiac blood flow. But there's a third measurement around, and, and that one um, is actually very good for our population, the neonates. That's because it uses a very high frequency probe, so it doesn't have much penetration, but we don't need much penetration to measure the heart in our preterm population. And this um, technique is called blood speckle imaging. And I will show you some examples of this. This is an apical four-chamber view with the apex at the top. And, the, and as you can see here, this is doing diastole, the, the speckle imaging is following the intracardiac blood flow. And as you could see there with the inflow and the outflow, here doing diastole, it starts again. You can see this beautiful vortex, elongated vortex sort of happening um, around the time. This, oh, excuse me. This next one is, is, is a similar kind of baby, but for instance, is very different. It's much more chaotic. It has smaller vortices that quickly disappear, they're not very elongated. And maybe this is one of those examples of how a vortices can tell something about the efficiency of the heart. Um, it can be done in the right ventricle as well as the fetal trials um, um, have shown. So the right atrium on the left going to the right ventricle. And then you see that little vortex formation just before the pulmonary valve, before it goes into the pulmonary trunk. And we're currently also playing with right atrium blood flow patterns to look at how the right atrium fills itself and if that is related to kinetic energy and the amount of preload the right ventricle receives. So the imaging and the measurements we can do on it, we can look at uh, different sort of parameters and these are the ones we specifically use in the left ventricle, looking at vortex length and vortex width, which is the elongation factor. And the number of vortices um, during the cardiac cycle, we look at signs of turbulence, 
vortex area and the timing of the actual vortices. Um, but importantly, I guess, what is more important, we have to look at uh, kinetic energy as a proxy for shear stress. Simple physics would dictate if you have an old location with a direction and a velocity, and a new location of that same particle and direction and the velocity, you can calculate energy parameters like kinetic energy, energy dissipation, kin uh, kinetic energy fluctuation, and vortices. So, we're currently doing a study in the NICU period. We're trying to look at your geometry, function, blood speckle imaging, kinetic energy at seven days when the baby is most stable, sort of after birth, and at 36 weeks to see which babies have what pattern early on to help predict their cardiac development and if they would develop um, dilated hypertrophy at 36 weeks of age. But most importantly, and this is always the hardest to do, you know, we do need adult outcomes to actually make some sense of what we find here, even though all the uh, presumptive evidence is there to say this is likely going to cause some problems in these particular individuals over time. Besides blood and blood flow and intercardiac blood flow, we can also look at it in a slightly different way. We, for instance, can look at what are the accelerators of hypertrophic growth. And, and, and studies have shown that there are several biochemical accelerators which we are already aware of. We know that thyroid hormone is a very strong accelerator of hypertrophic growth. Um, and we did a lot of studies in the 80s and the 90s looking at this, but I actually have not found any data which is related to the adult cardiac outcomes of these particular patients. And I think whoever has done a study like this should probably look back at their data and maybe see if they can find these individuals as an adult to see what their hearts would look like. Um, steroids, glucocorticoids also are accelerators of hypertrophic growth. And this is indeed a little bit concerning. We do it antenatally, and there is now a renewed trend towards giving prophylactic hydrocortisone in this um, young population. It might have short-term benefits, but should we worry about the long-term benefits of glucocorticoids in this population very early after birth? Mineralocorticoids actually delay hypertrophic growth. So this is an interesting aspect and something which we need to study. Spironolactone is the drug which would be most used to do that um, and has some beneficial effects in adults which have diastolic heart failure, so a stiffer heart, um, which could be hypertrophic. So this is something which we certainly have to look into if um, sort of supporting the situation with spironolactone in the first few weeks might change this. I don't know much about insulin growth factor, but I couldn't find any data related to adult cardiac development. Um, certain fatty acids give a certain um, um, acceleration of hypertrophic growth. And for this, we can look at two important components, human milk use, which would always be the best, but also what is our TPN composition? What kind of fatty acids are in there? And which are the strongest accelerators for hypertrophic growth? And the last bit, which I think we're already doing very good in, high oxygen tension is an accelerator of hypertrophic growth. And over time, we have developed saturation targets and are certainly avoiding high oxygen in the first few weeks of life. So this is a, a good development in relation to adult cardiac development. Can we do something about it? I come back to the question again. As I think we've learned with all these studies that the key changes occur in the first eight to 10 weeks after preterm birth. That's a very short period of time. It also means that maybe an early and a short-term intervention or change of what we do now has the potential to prevent the pathway of abnormal cardiac development or whatever happening. So this is something we should focus on. So I got two slides to summarize before we can do some um, questions. Um, the preterm birth, does lead to cardiac modeling in the NICU period. And we label this cardiomyopathy of prematurity. The available evidence suggests that this will lead to earlier heart failure in adult life. And I think the available evidence is very convincing and only growing. The origins of cardiac modeling in the NICU period are not well understood yet. And we do need to do some more work here to get better understanding. We do know that intracardiac blood flow patterns play a major role in determining the shape of and thus might help diagnose the early stages of cardiomyopathy or prematurity. And we hope to show you some data probably in the next year or so. Um, and then last, I think we need to be aware of accelerators of um, cardiomyopathy or prematurity and early maturation. And we need to consider those in any future studies we design.
Um, I thank you for your attention and we have some time for some questions. Thank you so much, Kurt. Um, I think everyone here will agree with me that you take the prize for the best slides. Thank How you. the hell do you find all these images, man? My God, amazing. So we, we've got a couple of questions on the chat pane. Um, we'll do the two from Dr. Sam from Singapore first. So he's got two questions. One is to comment on the cardiac outcome in IUGR infants. And second, if there is an increased rate of coronary artery disease in preterm adults, and is there any link to the lipids we give them? So the, the first question is probably best studies. Cardiac function um, in gross restricted babies and small gestation rates kind of babies is definitely different than there would be in a similar gestation rate babies. And I do think that has to do with how the heart is shaped. The cardiac function is dependent on the size of a myocardial slice. And I showed you those um, myocardial layers, how well they are formed and how they can function over time. And I do think that also has to do with when that the gross restricted babies have a higher mortality overall. But if the gross restricted baby goes completely, you know, uncompromised, he's fine. Um, but once you give them a challenge, they show that they have less reserve. If you give them a sepsis, if you give them something which the heart has to work harder for, that's when they generally die. So um, this is an important aspect. But for instance, I guess this is maybe not where neonatologists can do something about it because this is how they are delivered over time. Um, we can absolutely try to prevent situations where they would require increased cardiac demand. The second question is actually a little bit harder. They, I haven't showed you much data because I, I think there wasn't enough time and I like the mechanical bits more than the biochemical bits. Um, but there is indeed some data about which fatty acids are most likely to, call, uh, to cause um, early uh, acceleration, and that's in laboratory. So the studies which are happening now, they're all happening because they try to make a, um, a stem cell from a neonatal cardiomyocyte, and they want to put them in adults with myocardial infarcts. And you know what? They couldn't get them to mature. They couldn't get, they were too big or they were too sideways. So they, they, they're trying to find out how to get them into the right pathway. So that's where most of this data is coming from. There's a huge body of evidence which we can present on maybe another platform, but um, I, I, there is a list. There are some fatty acids which are more important than others. The relationship to coronary artery disease is a, is a little bit tricky because there are so many factors from birth to you know, getting coronary artery disease, which are also have to be included into that sort of story. And indeed, uh, the one study from Crump, they did show an increased risk, but it wasn't significant. But I do think it, had, it is all sort of related to each other. Okay, thank you. Um, um, this one is from Dr. Rao. And uh, he's asking if atrial ectopics in term infants, which we see very commonly, explained by developmental maturation of the conduction system. Um, I don't think we have the true answer, but my, my feeling would be yes. Um, so specifically during specification of morphogenesis is where a lot of studies have been done to relate it to congenital heart disease. So you obstruct a certain age rate to see what happens and you see with what kind of cardiac heart disease would develop. And in these very early phases, indeed, you can make changes to the maturation of the, of the conduction system. Is there anything you can do for that? Um, you have to wait till they're matured. <laughs> yes. So um, one of the questions um, Rahul had was that we give um, diuretics forever to some of our babies, especially the ones with cardiac disease, waiting for them to grow for a time for the cardiac surgeons to, to be big enough for the cardiac surgeons to attack or fix. What does that do to their muscles and the cells? So I don't think we have that information. Um, you will have to look at a much larger cohort for the effects of diuretics. And look, um, there's differences. Eh? So we know frusamide on a very short, um, the first 24 hours will reduce your uh, diastolic pressure for just a little bit and then stops working. It's the same in adults. 
However, if we give spironolactone, which is an, is an um, RAS inhibitor, is a very different function. An aldosterone antagonist works very differently on the heart than as a diuretic. So I would see parenthesis spironolactone not as a diuretic, but as a cardiac modulator. And when you use it as a cardiac modulator, you probably also have to design a different study where you're just going to say, look, you know, half of you are going to get some um, spironolactone from birth till the end and, and others don't, or maybe for a couple of weeks. And um, it's not clear, of course, how long you have to do, but I would guess four to six weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Rao, are you happy with that? <laughs> okay, four to six weeks. We sometimes have that for a lot longer. Okay, so um, what what would your advice be for the preterms, Kurt? To um, you know, after they go home from us, we are, we are so concerned about their lungs. You know, the heart's beating; they forget about it. What would their long term cardiac follow up be? Okay. Especially the little micropremies, the ones yeah. that uh, Professor Kudu, Kutsuda looks after so well. Yeah, they, they they will be at highest risk for not only the heart but also the lungs and the and kidneys. I guess for all our friends, and this, you know, I gave this talk to cardiologists for a couple of years, and, and most of them, they haven't been aware that just as you ask, you know, are you smoking, are you drinking, are you obese, there should be a tick box. Were you preterm? And how preterm were you? And, and they're really starting to get this that there is just a tick box for them, which they have to realize as a risk factor. It's not modifiable for them at that point anymore, but I would certainly recommend our preterm population to see an adult cardiologist or an renal physician at say, I don't know, um, 20, 25 years of age, start there, just have a baseline and, and build it up from there. Okay, I'm wondering if I could ask um, Dr. Kusuda to comment please, because in Japan, you have the, probably the highest cohort of adult micropremy survivors. What was your cardiac follow-up for these children? Uh, this is this is Satoshi Kusuda. Thank you, thank you, Coach. I always remember I visited the John Hunter Hospital. Yes. That, that was very nice uh, experience for me. Uh, thank you for very fantastic uh, lecture today. Uh, yes, we follow up the very preterm infant, but unfortunately our follow up rate is not high, so we do not have. Uh, systemic data so far, but yes, we, we are sure to uh, make this preterm infant healthy even uh, after discharging uh, in the ICU. Uh, I have one, one question. Can I, can I, Julie? Of, of course, of course. Uh, from the point of uh, myocardial, uh, do you think we should uh, close the PDA? because PDA is a high flow for the cardiac function. It can make maybe turbulence flow. So maybe it's not good if we keep PDA open for a long time. So from that point, what do you think? We should close as possible early or we should wait if it's not symptomatic? So you look at, I think it's a very good question because the PDA, we know if we just uh, do the treatments based on early um, results, um, we don't have the right tools. I think that's always the hardest with the PDA, but if it comes from pure um, hypothesizing like we do here in this particular presentation, I, I would agree with you. The PDA gives very early dilatation of the heart and very early change from um, vortex formations, which are nice and elongating to uh, more chaotic, to a dilatation. So the heart has already did those first steps compensating for those changes I find in the first three days of life. So if you want to do something about that, you probably have to do it very, very early on if that is your main concern. How to do that and which medication to use is a, is a, is a different topic. But um, I do think if you want a normal development, it seems to be the right idea. However, both Nilkan's study and the study by Cox could not find that the PDA or the duration of the PDA, we looked at the PDA for more than 10 days as a criteria or 14 days. And actually it was not in logistic regression analysis, a factor which was related to dilated hypertrophy. So it was a bit surprising to us. We were almost convinced now it must be the PDA okay, related. You. And it wasn't. 
thank you for very uh, clear answer. Thank you so much, both of you. And we might take one last question from Dr. Agrawal, Rajiv Agrawal. Uh, Rajiv asked that you mentioned eight to 12 weeks before birth is the best time to do preventive measures. So is this an already program? Uh, yeah, no, that's condition. actually the question. Um, after birth, no, no. I, I, if you want to do something preventive, you have to do it from birth. Um, so literally day one or day two, you have to start your pre preventive measures. Now, what exactly your preventive measures are going to be is something nobody has crystallized yet. Um, Afif al Kufash wrote a very nice paper on how breast milk could be beneficial in this. And we don't know if maybe donor human milk can be beneficial in this, but there's a lot of unknowns which we just need to have more data early on because we won't get the answer till 60 years later, which is really annoying. Um, but it just seemed to be coming our way. Annoying. Um, if you want to do something, you want to change your um, behaviors and things you offer these little hearts, do it at birth. Very good. Okay, so um, Kurt, thank you again so much for fascinating talk and the best slides ever. For everyone on the room, his email is on the chat pane. So please do email him and he's given us permission to post um, the talk, right? Yeah. All good, thank you. And we do have a Mandarin translation as well. We are so good. So uh, thank you, Kurt. So just as a um, um, quick word for our next week's talk, this is a very special event um, dedicated to Dr. Vishnu Rasaya, who many of you would know, but Professor Andrew Uwa, who did the definitive studies on mass pulse oximetry screening in well newborn infants. It's at um, a slightly different time to our usual 5 p.m. or 1 p.m. It's Sydney 8 a.m. Um, which gives a London time of 9 a.m. on March the 25th of Thursday. So we'll advertise this on our social media pages um, and uh, please do share our links with your friends and colleagues and we welcome anyone to join this, um, this talk next week. So without further ado, um, please join us in thanking Kurt again. There were more than a hundred of you online today, including many, many of our friends from China and um, yeah, fascinating talk. Go for a swim now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, go for a surf. Send us pictures. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. Bye bye.